As was said, I am from Canada, so I'm a bit jet lagged today. But um, I'm here today to talk to you about uh, my recent experience working with our um, engineering team to develop our, um, re our uh, billing API in GraphQL. So, uh, to give you a little bit of context, uh, I'm a UX designer. And at Shopify, we form our teams based on um, problem spaces rather than disciplines. Um, so we have cross-functional teams, um, and uh, we have different service lines as well as product lines. So I work on the platform product line. And um, actually, before I get too far into this, does any who knows what Shopify is? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Not to be mixed up with Spotify. <laughs> um, and is anyone aware of the Shopify um, partner ecosystem? Uh, yeah, a few. Okay. So um, our partner uh, ecosystem is actually um, a third-party like developer platform where we enable um, developers like yourselves to connect with our merchants and help them. Um, provide solutions for some of the niche needs or functionality that doesn't come out of the box with our Shopify platform. Um, so the platform product line serves that ecosystem and more specifically I work on the billing domain within the app store which is where our developers can then like sell these, these solutions to our merchants. Um, so this is actually quite a, a highly technical space and to make it even more complex billing itself or you know the, the the industry of finance and money is, is quite complex and sensitive to um, humans. So this is uh, quite has been quite a uh, learning experience being on this team. <laughs> um, so the product that I work on is the billing API, and this is something that serves our third-party app developers, and it allows the developers to charge our Shopify merchants directly through their store account. Um, it also does, so we have like an, the extended version of the API also helps them connect to their admin and all that, but the billing API is, is sort of a uh, required um, integration for being listed in our app store. So this was originally built in REST. It's, uh, how many people are familiar with REST? Awesome. And then uh, our goal was to build this in GraphQL. This is something that we are moving towards as an, uh, sorry, as an organization. So how many folks are familiar with GraphQL? Oh, awesome. <laughs> uh, so originally our goal was to launch at a Shopify event called Unite. Um, and we did this by uh, holding a workshop uh, where we took our um, developers through the actual API and helped them kind of get their hands dirty and looking at um, the billing API. Um, so this was actually quite a stretch goal for us. We didn't realize just how hard it would be to build parity for this one, like for uh, this API. I mean, originally, like our goal was let's just make the functionality available in GraphQL so that we can increase the adoption in um, GraphQL because overall the API, um, given that it, the billing part was a required thing, no one was really adopting GraphQL because they couldn't be on our our like app store if they didn't have the billing component, which wasn't in the API. So, um, in doing this, we um, we discovered a lot of things along the way, and we were quite um, close to not making this deadline. But um, I'm going to share a little bit of the story behind how we we did get there successfully, and. Um, ended up having a really great uh, reception at our workshop for this API. People were really excited leaving, um, leaving the event. So I know everyone's, like most people here seem to be familiar with GraphQL, but um, basically just to give anyone who might not be a bit of a background, um, the, the main difference here is that with GraphQL, the flexibility is given to the actual client. So um, actually, one more quick scan. Um, how many folks here develop APIs that are not for your own client or for yourself? Oh, <laughs> smaller group. Uh, okay, so this is, um, yeah, this is, this is where I think UX gets to, uh, to be a little more important here because um, the, the main difference is that rather than just asking for resources and getting back a list where you can, um, you know, then drill down a little bit deeper, GraphQL um, requires a more logical structure and hierarchy that uh, will allow you to ask more specific questions or queries. 
So um, at this point, you might be asking yourself, well, why do I even have to care? Like, what does UX really have to do with technical products or API design? Um, and you know, I, I totally agree. <laughs> when I was when we were first starting up this project as a team, I was not even considered as part of the, the project team. Um, but at at standups, it was um, becoming really clear that our team was struggling to get past some of the more like um, decision making aspects because there was this knowledge gap of how users were going to use it. Um, so really. At the, the core of a great API is an enjoyable, intuitive user experience, uh, but we tend to forget that. And so uh, just to kind of zoom out a little bit, when we look at the like, actual makeup of the word or of the acronym API, it stands for Application Programming Interface. Um, and though it's not the traditional GUI that um, comes to mind when we think about user experience, um, the word interface is literally part of the definition. So even though it's done through programming rather than a graphical interface, the job is to enable this interaction. And so to go a little deeper into this definition, what is, what is an interface? Um, it's basically a point where two things connect. Um, and this is, again, just to remind everyone, an API is first and foremost for people, and I believe uh, our notes spoke or has presented some of this material um, before. But yeah, it's. I think this is something that, as developers, um, people tend to forget um, because we're often really <laughs> we're we're we often think of technical products as as that just a technical object, but we forget that the developers who have to use it are human as well. So um, just a little side note, I noticed that there was a bit of a Star Trek theme, so I quickly <laughs> <laughs> tried to follow with the scheme here. Um, and so to, to break it down into a language that might be a little more digestible for developers, um, if an API equals interface and a developer equals user, which we've now established, then using an API is user experience. Um, okay, so let's back up a little bit. Developers are the users, but that does not mean that you know everything about the user. Um, users are usually very different than those who write the code, and even when the developers, uh, even when they are developers, they have different backgrounds, experiences with user interfaces, mindsets, mental models, and goals. They are not us. So yes, acknowledge that we are like that. Developers are users as well, and that technical products need some user experience, thought, and empathy. But uh, that doesn't mean that you're going to only be drawing from your own intuition and your own experiences. So how do you start to empathize with developers? Um, well, think about, let's think about UX in general. Uh, I think great UX is kind of like a really well-trained companion dog that you know, knows you really well. So it's something, someone that is uh, consistent and trustworthy, you know, even when they're a little unpredictable, like kind of like a dog will always kind of get up on your face if you have food. Um, uh, it feels human, even if it's highly technical or a different species in this case. Um, and it is discoverable, even if it's not the main star, but um, it's also very easy and simple, um, even if there are some complexities and challenges along the way. So one of my favorite um, kind of influential thought leaders in the world of UX and software uh, says it quite nicely that good design, when it's done well, becomes invisible. It's only when it's done poorly that we notice it. So going back to the dog analogy, it's kind of like you, um, a good dog, you just have a lot of fun with and you don't really think about it, but then when there's a badly trained dog that comes into your face, you're like, ah, oh, what happened to you? <laughs> you know, why are you so like, why are you acting out so much? So it's, it's a very similar experience when you come to a good product, you don't think about it, you just feel like, oh, that was a really great experience, or, um, you know, this was so natural, how is this not in my life? Um, whereas when you come across a bad experience, you notice everything about it, and, and you, come, you come away with a bad taste in your mouth. So some helpful questions to uh, guide the design of user experience, I think, 
um, you know, is to really tap into your empathy by asking questions like, who will be using this API? Uh, what problem does it solve? What are some of the use cases um, that we're trying to address here? Um, and make sure that that's scoped too, like don't go for the whole world and try and solve every use case. I think it's important to be very specific and, and pointed. Um, and also what could get in the way of an enjoyable experience? What are some things that could, you know, leave the person with a bad taste in their mouth? Um, and how do users understand this problem set? So this one here is quite um, important for GraphQL because uh, like GraphQL kind of naturally um, requires you to have a strong understanding of the domain so that you can build the right hierarchy. And that's, that's where you can um, really take advantage of user experience um, like specialists because they can help you understand that domain from a, you know, outside of this, like outside of your own bubble kind of thing. So uh, what does UX thinking look like for API? Um, so here are some things that we did to improve the UX which guided us towards a more improved API experience. Um, the first thing that I'd like to highlight is uh, to collaborate. I think that um, a lot of times we underestimate the kind of wealth of insights and ideas that come from non-technical people, um, myself being one of them. <laughs> so I had even excluded myself from these discussions. And when I realized the nature of GraphQL and as I learned what that was, um, you know, to be quite honest, I didn't really even know what exactly an API was, I knew it from a high level, um, and I found myself, you know, constantly uh, feeling a little bit of imposter syndrome because I didn't know this, so welcome, you know, non-technical people with open arms because they can really um, help shed some light into some of the more intuitive aspects that you can tap into. Um, and just note that sometimes these discussions can be really difficult because, you know, as developers, you might have a different language than you know, a UX person or a content person. Um, so try and use some uh, like visuals, like maybe diagrams or models, um, maybe even form a glossary that can help you create a vocabulary that's common to everyone so that you're not just stuck on the words or the definitions, but you're actually progressing on these conversations and creating better alignment by, um, you know, using things that are common to everyone. So uh, teams that fail, fail to listen to each other. Um, this is, you know, an example, uh, a real life example of this is that our, you know, as I had mentioned, our developers had gotten stuck into this uh, feedback loop and they were debating over these implementation details. Um, and it was, it was, you know, he, neither here nor there, like you really could have gone one way or the other. And, and um, but without the user's perspective, it was too difficult for them to decide or even get past each other's egos to like really um, figure out what was the best thing to do here. So um, I think what I'm trying to get at here is, is like just be open to what each other have to say and really try and build that empathy for each other as well as your user. Um, researching other examples. So. Um, looking at similar examples to uh, like understand what the thinking was. I think this was a huge help for us, especially in the beginning, is um, really trying to unfold the story behind some of the other kind of popular APIs in our system that were well known. Um, so I think the, the one point I want to make here is that you know, it's great to look at other documentations and other APIs and structures to figure out, you know, what, like to, to understand or to try and kind of um, imitate it. But I think that it's not enough to really just copy what's being done there. That You really need to break down and um, understand the narrative behind how they came to make those decisions so that um, you can make it more specific to your own context. So what we did was we looked at um, other billing APIs, or, uh, sorry, like Stripe and Braintree, which are payment gateways. Um, and we also looked at Apple and Google, um, which are other uh, marketplaces similar to our context. And then we compared the different user uh, use cases, broke down similarities and differences. Um, and this helped us to understand why they made these decisions. Like, for example, uh, Stripe breaks out their usage records from the price and the charge itself. 
Um, and usage-based pricing is kind of like uh, if, you know, every time I use this thing, then you can charge me. Um, however, the way that we had it was the price was stuck to the actual uh, event of usage. Um, but it wasn't until we looked at how Stripe modeled it that we realized this is not very flexible or scalable. Um, and when we looked at our own like, feature requests or feedback from uh, our partners, we saw that there was a need to break this out because they wanted uh, more flexibility in the way that they build their um, their uh, sorry customers because they wanted to be able to calculate kind of what is the price based on how much the person used so like volume based or graduated or tiered um, billing was something that couldn't be done if the price was fixed to the actual usage. Um, Another thing is to interview users, so talk to the actual humans directly, uh, learn about their current solutions, their motivations, the things that they get stuck on, um, also like how they view the world, how they view this industry or the mental models behind that. Um, it's really easy for us to fall into biases um, when we're talking to interviewers, so uh, do try if you have the resources to talk to someone who is a researcher, consult with them and work with them to try and avoid influencing um, your participants when you do like have interviews. Um, and so like uh, one thing to avoid is leading questions. This is like the, the easiest thing to do when you're talking to someone is accidentally you know, point them in a direction that comes from your own bias. Um, so an example of a leading question would be, um, for example, I saw you were having difficulty with the navigation, what happened? Um, and you're inferring to them that they were having difficulty. However, one way that you can strip the bias out of that is maybe asking uh, what was easy or difficult about getting to the content you wanted. Um, this helps to kind of provide a bit of a balance where you're not necessarily suggesting that they were having difficulty, but you're asking where, you know, what they were looking for and, and how easy or difficult was that. Um, and this is important because if you uh, start with a leading question, you're probably not going to get the insight that you weren't expecting. Um, and you, like sometimes that like user uh, usability testing can be used in a negative way and that you are really just looking to validate your own assumptions and that's what you want to avoid. Um, you, like if you are a true seeker of truth, um, you will work with a user <laughs> usability or researcher who can help guide you through this process. Um, next thing is that we modeled the concept. Um, so as I said before, like words can get very dodgy. Um, everyone has different um, layers of meaning and context when it comes to our vocabulary. So map out and visualize the objects and relationships that are involved. And then this can be a really great tool to align on things like the system, the taxonomy, and the schema of your API. Uh, this is especially important when you're working in a large ecosystem like Shopify. We have many different product lines, many different service lines. We have um, like all sorts of different ecosystems with multiple stakeholders. So using um, visuals to help guide our stakeholders through to make sure that they understand things the way that we also are um, intending or the way that we have internalized it is very, very, very important. Um, one suggestion here is to use analogies and um, to, to help you illustrate the concept. So here's an example of a domain domain model that helped us, uh, sorry, helped to inform our schema. It's also something that we present in our documentation to help our users understand um, kind of our thinking behind the way that we've structured the schema. Um, and then here's another example of a journey map uh, of an actual charge that goes through the multiple systems that are involved in our ecosystem here. So you see that, you know, the start. Uh, the merchant has triggered a billing charge and then it goes to the app, which creates the app developer and then creates a charge through our API. Shopify verifies that and then um, sends that back to the merchant to approve. Um, and then whether or not they approve, it will um, kind of go to a different URL that is uh, dictated by the API. Okay, so uh, I think this is the last point that I'm going to talk about. Um, so testing the usability is really important. Um, uh, I know there was a talk on this before as well, but um, 
definitely, I want to reiterate, like definitely try and find a way to t test out the, your logic or your thinking, some of your core, core concepts and the modeling that you've, you have even before you write any code. Um, so find a way to present this logic and then just talk with your users and, and get them to um, have that conversation with you. Try and be as objective as possible. Again, work with a researcher when possible. Um, so here's where we started. We, um, after having worked out a lot of the kinks just by doing our research and talking to uh, our API patterns team and other um, kind of domain experts within our organization, we had an idea of where we were going to go with it. We drafted the documentation. Um, and then we sent this to some of our participants. So we have a great pool of of um, partners that are super interested in um, giving us feedback. Um, they're real engaged with our product, um, so we're quite lucky. Um, but yeah, we asked, so we had picked about 10 partners and we asked them to um, schedule sessions with us. And in advance of that schedule, we sent them the um, document draft and then uh, asked them to familiarize themselves with it and um, accompanied it with the survey here that you see and asked them to um, just capture their initial thoughts on it. Like, how did they find the um, understand, like how did they find kind of like the understandability of it and um, then we kind of fleshed that out a little bit more in person. So once we interviewed the users, we took them through an exercise called tree testing. Is anyone familiar with tree testing? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so there's a great tool by Optimal Workshop. Um, they also have card sorting um, and then this uh, feature called Tree Jack. And this is a common exercise for when you're trying to um, flesh out the uh, navigation or just like usability of the structures that you might have created. So it lended itself really well to um, testing out our GraphQL schema. And so we presented it uh, to the users as this tree and then um, took them through some of our more common use cases and asked our, our partners to kind of try and find this information using uh, this tree. So um, what was interesting about this exercise was that we learned more than we had expected in that like, for example, in the first use case, uh, we're asking them to just double check that a monthly subscription has gone through after a free trial. And um, in order to do that, we anticipated that they uh, that partners would go through the um, subscription line items and then check the actual pricing details within the plan. Um, but a lot of users actually ended up going through a feature called that we had um, just like recently put in called raw subscriptions, and this was also a you know, perfectly fine way to find out whether or not something. Uh, whether or not this charge had gone through because it would have it would return to all the most recent subscriptions and What this ended up telling us is that uh, not only were um, Users under like able to find it through the way that we had anticipated But users were also using other parts of the structure that we hadn't realized could serve the same purpose So it helped us validate that we had um, you know, we were on the right track so to recap, um, some of the things that you can do to help improve your user experience, um, definitely collaborate, um, collaborate with your non-technical folks, um, build a team um, to like help you learn empathy uh, for your users, research what was done before, and um, more importantly, learn why they made those decisions, interview actual humans who will be using this product, um, model the concept in a visual way when possible, and test out the usability to see how intuitive the experience is. Okay, so um, now just a couple quick things about what I learned throughout this process, aside from what API actually means. Um, I also walked away with some really important lessons. So first thing first, naming is really hard. Like it's really, really hard. It caused a lot of fights and arguments. Um, and to a point where I had to start telling people, like, just blur your eyes. Don't look at the words. Like, just, just like, listen to what I'm trying to convey here as a concept, um, so that we can build on this. Um, 
So like I mentioned before, work on a glossary, this really helps because uh, some people can be really semantic or pedantic about these things, and um, even if they don't agree on the, the actual term, um, having a glossary can help them move past that and then you know, convince them that like, later on we'll, we'll do more research and we'll dive deeper into this and we'll finalize the terminology later, but right now what's more important is figuring out how to build this, what is the structure, what, you know, what do we actually need to do here. <coughs> Um, the second thing I learned was that oversimplification, oversimplification can complicate things. That is not a simple word. Um, so I think one of the things that um, happens to any company that starts small and grows really big is that you start with really simple, deliverable, uh, value-driven products or features. Um, and then later on, as your ecosystem evolves, you Realize, oh, there are so many more things that we didn't consider when we first started building this. So um, this is unfortunately a huge thing that we are dealing with as a company who has scaled from a small size to now being pretty global. Um, and we, I think there are a lot of instances of where we have taken complex concepts and have oversimplified them. And billing is definitely one of those areas. Um, so here's an example, just a quick one. We um, we were working with an existing API, and uh, so, like the one that I mentioned in REST, um, so a lot of our, our um, designs needed to be backwards compatible. Um, however, we also had a lot of workarounds that were created um, by our, our users, and this made a lot of you know confusing situations where we weren't really sure how the uh, user was actually using this API. So for example, uh, in our REST, API, we only have four endpoints. Um, so one of them is a recurring application charge. Then we have one-time application charges. Um, and then we also have an application credit for anyone who wants a refund, we give them a Shopify credit. And then we also have this thing called the usage charge. And that wasn't actually originally part of our um, billing API endpoints, but um, by popular demand, we added it in. and. Um, it also had the parameter of price as well as the instance. Um, so how we've evolved this is now we've, um, instead of attaching a usage charge, so looking back, instead of attaching a usage charge to a recurring application charge, we've broken it down into app subscriptions and then um, made recurring a plan as well as usage a different plan. Um, and then with usage, you also have something called usage records, which helps uh, you to keep track of how many times that, that instance occurred. And then you can um, hopefully in the future be able to um, kind of create more varied or flexible um, pricing models. So this is where uh, we're, right now we still are supporting prices with usage, but that's something that we're hoping to deprecate later. And this is another situation where something simple has become complicated. Um, and then last but not least, not all feedback is equal. So um, there's this really popular adage that the customer is always right. This is not the case. Um, <laughs> yes, user feedback is important, but don't take it as law or don't take it as you know every item on your roadmap. Um, it's important to zoom out, look at the patterns, um, and then also integrate that with your actual product vision and make sure that that is there as well, that you're informing the experience and that um, you're helping to shape the behaviors and the, the interactions that you actually are looking for. Um, so that's it.